this after. All right. We are recording. So, like I said, today we're talking about the post-World War II economy before we get into some primary source breakdown. So, we're going to talk about the causes and effects of the growth of the United States in the years following World War II, specifically in the economy. And then we're going to also talk about a little bit of migration that happened throughout the U.S. So, a couple of key terms. Some of these might be familiar, things like GI Bill, suburbanization, which is like suburbs being built. Uh, a couple of new things like Sun Belt, Baby Boom, we'll get into all that stuff. But this is why we're going to talk about boomers, I guess you could say, for the first time, right? The Karens and the boomers of the world are going to be born during this time period, at least during this era, right? And Unit 8 is when the Karens and the boomers are born. So not quite the boomers here. like They're, they're not the adults, but they are being born. So let's get into all that stuff. So post-World War II economy. First key point. A uh, burgeoning, burgeoning, that's a fancy academic term for you there, a burgeoning private sector, which means like a growing, but growing really well and nice and fancy um, private sector, federal spending, the baby boom, and technological developments help spur on economic growth, right? Help increase it, help spur it on. So again, burgeoning, if you do not know burgeoning, it's like to grow, but to grow a lot, a lot of growth quickly. That's burgeoning. Well, actually, no, burgeoning is more like a little bit of growth, or not a little bit, what if, like the, the, it's starting to grow. There you go. It's starting to grow. I apologize for that. A burgeoning private sector, it's starting to grow. Um, federal spending, baby boom, technological development helped spur on economic growth. So again, burgeoning, fancy term burgeoning means starting to grow. I'll give you guys about a minute on here. So I wanna make sure we have time to hit some documents and actually no, we'll do a minute and a half just in case. All right. About a minute left on the clock. So again, right before we close out, we got a little less than a minute on the clock. There's a burgeoning private sector, which means it's starting to grow, just starting to grow. Um, those of you that are finished or that are finishing up quick yes or no in the chat, uh, private sector, y'all know what that is or you need me to break that down really quick? Break that down, okay. So the private sector, what that means is private companies doing like important jobs. So, okay. So basically me, right? History teacher. I teach, I teach at a charter school, right? I had idea. You guys all go to idea. Y'all know idea. Charter schools are public, so they're not quite private. But if I were to say, leave my job at a public school and go work at a private school, that's me leaving a job in, in what you would call like the public sector, right? To go to the private sector. Does that make sense? The private sector is like a separate company that's privately owned, independently owned, and they're doing stuff separate from what say the bigger stuff is doing. So it's really easy to see with schools. You can also see it with like defense spending, right? So like nowadays, especially not like it's a, it's a little bit of it is now like it's barely a thing in the, in this era. But like the idea of, oh, you're in the military for four years and then you get out, but then you go join another service that's private that helps you use your military training to, you know, make you more money, things like that. Like teaching civilians or police officers how to, you know, train like military people. So that's the private sector, right? Private sector is just private businesses doing something that is usually like a public business or a government business or things like that. So when it's burgeoning, right, it's barely starting to grow. It's barely growing. It's barely a thing. So that's the private sector. And that was time. So if you guys have questions on that, or if I wasn't clear enough, please let me know and I will keep explaining it. Or I'll explain it in a different, I'll try to explain it in a different way. So basically, in a nutshell, the US economy after World War II 
It's very nice. Very nice, right? It's great things. It's doing great. It's wonderful. It is booming, as they say. Um, it is doing really well. Um, increased spending, increased productivity, and things like the interstate highway system, which is like a federal works program, will help make this even better. Right? We're gonna have new technologies. We're gonna have new ways to improve on old things, right? Like, look, what's this? What's this in color? Fancy color, what are we looking at there? What is that? Someone tell me what's in that nice, beautiful colored image, not the Borat one, the one across from it. What is that a modernized picture of? Yeah, but what are they doing to the car? Because it's not just one car, right? Room for, <laughs> no, but like not the car itself, but what is that? Nope, not quite. Look, look behind the guy with the clipboard. What does that remind you of? What's that supposed to be? Think production. They're making them in what type of sense? <laughs> she got them. They're mass producing them, but how? What's that thing called? Remember? You're the person who puts doors on for a living. You put tires on. It's a, oh, come on. We can't have forgotten that word. Henry Ford invented it, kind of. I know, guys. I know it's early. <laughs> They're making these cars. What's another word for making? Production lines is really close. It is a type of line. Oh, come on. Someone's got to remember it. I know it's early. I know it's eight. It's eight ten. I'm asking you to think. I'm the worst person on the planet right now. Nothing. Nothing. It's an assembly line. Assembly line. All right. Yes, assembly line. <laughs> it's an assembly line. Yeah, you got it. Just made it right at the buzzer. We would have had to review that call if it was at the buzzer. <laughs> um. Yeah, so this is an assembly line, right? They're still doing assembly lines. But if you notice, and I'm not the biggest expert on like a lot of telling the difference in some of these cars, but those look like either Dodges or Chryslers or something, right? So like by this point, there are other car makers out there, obviously, right? And But they're all doing the Henry Ford thing, at least for a while still. And so part of that is new technology. Part of that is they're able to make them better, right? That's why, hence the inspector guy with the clipboard at the very end, but everybody's still doing that job, right? A lot of... People get out of the war, they come back, they do jobs like that. Okay, let's move forward then. <laughs> Still laughing at see Borat. Or God on the slide. In Borat form of All right, so the GI Bill. You might want to write down the full like official term for the GI Bill, which is the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. Servicemen's Readjustment Act. It was like nicknamed the GI Bill. And with the GI Bill, World War II veterans are able to go to college for free, and they're able to buy houses at low interest with low interest loans. Um, real quick, yes or no? Low interest loans. You guys know what that means or no? Like, what's the difference between a low interest loan and a high interest loan? Real quick, yes or no? Um, okay, so basically, when you get a loan. Um, pretty much, right? So like when you go get a loan at a bank or something, um, you say, hey, here's what I got. Am I, you know, can you lend me some money? And if the bank tells you yes, they usually attach an interest rate to that, right? And that interest rate is how banks make money. Um, that's why it's really important, for example, like that you guys that are going to college real soon that you get federal college loans because they typically don't have interest rates or they're very low or they don't start till after you graduate. Like they're designed to help you better, right? So the way these work is they're, the interest rates are really, really, really low. And because the interest rate is so low, when you're they're paying back their mortgage, when they're paying for their house, they're not spending as much on it. Yeah, they're essentially getting it for less. They don't pay back the government as much as, say, Farmer Joe, who didn't enlist because, you know, he broke his leg. Farmer Joe gets a full interest loan. And, he you know, so, like, if you got a loan for... 30,000 over 30 years, let's say, you probably would have ended up paying for that loan and paid 45,000, right? Well, with the GI Bill, you get to pay 35,000 instead, right? You pay very little back. Um, and on top of the housing thing, which is gonna be important, we're gonna talk about housing in a second. Higher education opportunities lead to more money in the pockets of people, right? A lot of attorneys, judges, doctors, teachers, a lot of different 
former service members are able to increase their standard of living, right? They don't have to stay on an assembly line, right? Like their dads did. They get to go out, get educated and do something. Not everyone takes advantage of this, but a lot of the ones who don't can still claim this. Well, this was then, we'll get, so there's a thing with it, right? The military isn't a bad choice. It's just that nowadays, especially that so many people do it, it's, it's often a little better to go to college first because they can still kind of, especially you guys that can get in there, but we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, and again, these are the guys that came back from World War II, free college discounts. Well, the discount is just on home loans also, to be fair. They don't get like a coupon book. That'd be cool though. Um, okay. But yeah, more money in the pockets of people because education. The middle class is going to grow also. So a poor farm kid from Iowa before the war can come back home and instead of having to stay on the farm, can go to school, can become, I don't know, a lawyer. All of a sudden they're making more money. They are in need of housing. Well, the need of housing will be satisfied through this. Um, and part of why there's going to be a baby boom. And if you guys don't know what the baby boom is, it's pretty simple. Um, a whole bunch of people are making babies. That's the baby boom. And the circumstances for the baby boom are going to be a bunch of American veterans coming home from the war. That's one, right? People blow up babies. They didn't quite blow them up. No, they didn't blow them up. That would have been good. No, actually, no, that wouldn't have been good. We shouldn't blow up babies. Guys, don't blow up babies. That's the public service announcement for today. Um, but people coming home from the... <laughs> yep, that would have sent the Karens by, but you're not wrong. People coming home from the war, people having like money in their pockets, right? No one's, they're not broke anymore. The economy's doing really well. The Great Depression's over. People overall feeling good and overall general shifts in societal needs, right? Everything's doing well. The American economy is doing really great. Everybody's in really high spirits, right? We literally went from the big sad to the big war, right? And now we're feeling really, really good because we won the big war, the big sad's over, and we're doing great. So that's those are the opportunities that are going to lead to the baby boom. And we'll get into the baby boom after key point two, right? As higher education opportunities and new technologies rapidly expanded, increasing social mobility. And again, right, social mobility, the idea of I grew up, you know, a farmer during the Great Depression, a farmer's son. So I was broke, you know, as a joke, as they say. And then going in the military, getting out, getting better, or just overall, you know, increasing your status. Encourage migration to suburbs and many Americans to the South and the West. So migration is going to change as well. And we'll talk about all that in the next slides. About 45 seconds left. You know, you're not, that's true. There, there might be, um, let me see who that was. Um, see, you're not wrong. There might be, I have read that before that people are saying like, they're going to equate something to another baby boom. Also because of how the economy is doing right now, it's kind of like meh and that it's just gonna explode once everybody's able to go out and do stuff again. You're not wrong, the quarantine babies, you are certainly true there. I think you are onto something that could very much happen. So, so, so. Yes, so a reason why Texas and Florida and like Arizona, especially New Mexico, some of the Southern bits of California are going to fill up with people is during this era. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One is winter kind of sucks. Um, we got a little taste of that, right, a few weeks ago, and I know I was like, whew, this is overrated. But um, also different things like um, financial opportunities, right? So like that, that private sector we were talking about at the beginning, I don't think you were here for that, Isaac, but like that's starting to grow, and because, and it's starting to grow in places in the Sunbelt, in the Southwest, 
so yeah, Florida, Texas, those are all, I have a, a diagram that I'll show, I'll show you guys in a second, actually in about 20 seconds. That breaks all that down. But yeah, those are those are some of the states that are going to populate. They're, it, they're leaving, people are leaving the northern states and heading to some of those. Kind of like how they're doing now. I'm never going to look at snow the same again. I agree with you 100%. I'm telling you that the fact that even my dog was like not okay with the snow was kind of like, why are we in this? Like, why do you have me out here right now? Was like really concerning to me. That was my first warning that maybe snow's not all that great. But some people still like it, which is good. But I'm always going to be like, you took my power for three days, snow, three and a half days. Why? All right, let's move forward, guys. If you need more time or you need me to go back, let me know. So let's talk about the baby boom. The baby boom. Whoa, my screen went dark. Can you guys still see the screen? Everything good? Okay, it's back. Okay. Um, Americans are making babies like crazy. This is the baby boom, right? That's what it's called. The baby boom is just an era where everybody's making babies all at the same time. Uh, this is where the idea of like the nuclear family, if you've ever heard that term, right? The, the husband, the wife, the two children, or, you know, in this case, four, because baby boom. Um, that's where it comes from. Suburbs are going to also become a, I know I keep, it's almost like a recurring thing, right? Hey, suburbs are going to grow. Suburbs are going to grow. But this is where suburbs actually like explode. Suburbs, the way we know them now, start here. So from 1945 to 1960, a 15 year period, 50 million Americans will be added to the population. There will be an increased demand for housing and especially suburbs, which were the ones that fixed that need. That's a, yeah, that's a cool story. The idea like how, how, yeah, the, he, he's a, he's a boomer by nine days. That's funny. Yeah. It, it's, it's that short. Yeah. That's cool. Um, automobile, the car, right? I don't know why I called it automobile. I should, it says automobile and cars. Hey guys, it was, you know, it happens. Right, there's typos in my slides and that's how, you know, I make them. They're all typoed out. Um, but cars, roads, and highways are critical to suburban uh, to the suburban lifestyle and suburbanization. Is it, yep, that makes me a boomer. You are not wrong. The middle class will use the suburbs the most. Um, and this is mostly a white phenomenon. A lot of minorities are left inside the urban centers and cities. Um, a lot of middle class white families are moving out to suburbs. And the suburb, like in the picture below, like this is kind of a modern image of one, but that's where this comes from. And part of why people are able to live in the suburb more effectively now, the car, the highway, the highway is super important. I don't mean like local highways, like 410. I mean the interstate highways like I-10, I-35, highways that go from state to state that connect the country together. It makes it easier for people to drive through and around. And even like the 410s and the 1604 of the world that are local to certain cities or places, they help you get all the way across town fast. Can you imagine if you wanted to go all the way across town somewhere. I don't know where you'd be going, but you couldn't use the highway. Everything would take forever, right? There'd be traffic by like in ridiculous amounts. I stands for interstate. That is correct. I-35, I-10, interstate 35, 10. And I have a cool interstate map we'll see in a bit. But so highways are really, really, really crucial. So I'll give you about another minute and change on here to get the info that we need and then we'll move forward. Did the babies have car seats? Probably not early on, but yes. By I actually, let me double check um, before I say that. Um, so I believe so. Yeah. Oh no! Wow, I did not know that. Okay, so funny story. The car seat was invented in 1962. So actually, a few babies probably did. Pro a few too many babies probably went boom 
in car accidents, which is why they're like, hey, we should put some sort of seat in this car <laughs> that helps them out. So yeah. <laughs> so no, there wasn't a car seat. Sorry, guys, I'm laughing about dead babies. It happens, you know, we all gotta be, you know, get joy somewhere. Um, but yes. Um, so no, there was, that's a good question. There was no car seat until 62. So post baby boom. So maybe the the babies that were born at the tail end of the baby boom were able to enjoy the, the safety of car seats. Yeah, probably. Probably just put their baby in the car normal and have them, you know, get mauled by the, the seat belt or do the thing where they, like, you sit them on your lap and they're your airbag, which I've seen too many people do in, you know, like the 2000s and the 1990s where I'm like, that's not okay. You shouldn't do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe they strapped to the top of the car and we're like we'll see what happens you know if billy goes out we got like five more at home anyways <laughs> all right so i'm gonna go ahead and move forward i think we got all this info we need any more time or you need me to go back let me know so talking about suburbs let's talk about levitt town levitt town is a specific type of suburb and by the way Every major house builder in the United States basically builds houses like this. My house is built kind of like this, at least, you know, the 2020 version of something like this. And houses that are like bespoke built, so that are built like by one builder who builds one house and they, that's like really expensive houses, if that makes sense. Most houses that are, you know, middle class now are built either exactly like this or in certain ways like this. And what happens is this guy, William J. Levitt, has this idea and he buys big pieces of land that are outside of major cities. So they're empty, but the major cities are within you know, a few miles away. And he starts mass producing low cost homes that are organized on these like identical little lots, really close together. So if you go through a neighborhood, for example, and you notice that every like fourth house is like the same house. Um, just, you know, maybe the colors are different or maybe they're the same. This is the style that it is, right? The Levitt, uh, Levitt town style, right? The style of suburb. But what they do is they are low cost solutions to, ho to housing demand. So now um, let's say Jerry GI who just got back from the war a year ago and who decides, you know what? I wanna go to school but I got to find a house for my family because, you know, the babies are booming and all that stuff. What are we going to do? You buy a house like this. It's a little cheaper, but it's a, you know, it's a good house and it's, you know, you got good neighbors and it's outside of the city. So it's still close. So you can go to school and work. Yes. So if you're, if you're like, if your neighbor's house looks kind of like your house, but maybe it's flipped or the colors are different or something like that. It could be that the, the builder that built your houses originally did something like this. So like in my neighborhood, cause like I, I just bought a house, you guys know that. Um, in my neighborhood, if I drive through the neighborhood I can spot the houses that are like the floor plan that mine is, you know what I mean? You know the layout. It's true though, like, and you can do that. Like you, I can spot the houses that are my floor plan, plan just by driving or walking through my neighborhood. And when I was looking at houses I saw houses that were my floor plan but in, in other neighborhoods, you know what I mean? Like that's my house, but it's across town. And that's how a lot of people build houses now because it's cheaper for the builder. And for the most part, especially if you got a good builder, like it's good for the consumer, it's easy for the consumer. In theory, right? The locks wouldn't be the same and technically the rooms are in the same place, but who knows what is in each room, but it's true. I mean, so, like my mom likes my house, at least she tells me she does, but like my mom's house isn't like that. Like my mom's house is in a, in a place where they're, one of those builders didn't go. So like they're built by each house in that area is built by an individual builder, if that makes sense. They're not like really fancy, big, expensive houses, so, but they're built by individual builders. So in my mom's neighborhood, each house is different. Um, at least the one she's living in now, <laughs> not the one we were growing up in, but like, so, but yeah, this, this style of house building is born during the baby boom during post-World War II times. And the guy that created it's Levitt. I don't even think he's still in the house making business. 
But if you guys drive around town and you see signs for like DR Horton or Perry Homes or what's another one? I can't think of another one right now, but those are all uh, built like this, right? Like my house is a DR Horton and they're built in the style of this. So you can still buy houses very similar to this. Now, I do not know they are probably this close together. Just depends. Every builder is a little different, right? But so that's the idea, the concept of Levitt Town, and it's going to answer the housing need, right? I wouldn't say it's a crisis, but it's a need. But yeah, some houses are exactly the same. Yeah, you guys are right there. It can be concerning. All right, about 30 more seconds and then we'll move on. Will we ever talk about sundown towns? Probably not. Um, we, so maybe, because we're going to get into a lot of like the, you know, the civil rights stuff in a bit. So they might be like, you know, maybe I'll include them now that you think about it. Because they're not in the CED, but I'm already adding a civil rights day. So we might. I'm going to put that as a, as a probably actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, because we're going to do probably not next week, but the week after three days of civil rights. So we're going to do the usual, right? Like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, like African-American civil rights. Then we're going to expand it to like Asians, Native Americans and feminism. And then we're going to have a Chicano civil rights day, right? A Hispanic civil rights day. So we're going to do all three, especially that us in San Antonio, guys. I don't know if you know this, but like San Antonio, at least for like this region, this area of the country, this part of the country is like the hub of Hispanic civil rights. And like some of the heroes of Hispanic civil rights are from, or not maybe not from here, but they they operated here in San Antonio, like Henry B. Gonzalez or Jose Angel Gutierrez, who was a little South, he was in Crystal City. But as he came up in prominence, he was in San Antonio working with guys like Henry B, the Brown Berets, we're gonna talk about all that stuff. It's important that we know our history of our civil rights, everybody, right, regardless. So we will talk about Hispanic civil rights. You guys know that, right? You guys know that Henry B., the conven the guy who the convention center is named after, he was a big Hispanic civil rights guy. He was a congressman, helped a lot of people. Just making sure, it's important. You'd be surprised how many people don't know that and they think, I don't know what they who they think Henry B. was, but a lot of people. I, I worked in his son's office as an intern, so pretty cool. A lot of um, people would call and they'd reminisce about when Henry B. helped me in 1965. And it's like, okay, sir, but it's 2010. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's one of those things, but it's it's uh, interesting. Okay, so let's move forward. Spend too much time on Levitt Towns. Let's talk about interstate highways. So again, a major, major significant contribution to this are interstate highways. And what they do, what they allow for is faster, easier travel in ways that people didn't necessarily have before. Like, yes, the car sped things up, but in 1930 or 1925, right? If you live, I don't know, let's just pick a place, right? Right here in the middle of Texas. There's no way for you to drive to New York easily. There's no way for you to get to California or, you know, Dakota, right? Wherever you want to go. There's no way to get there. There's no easy way to get there, at least. And what the interstate highways do, and Eisenhower puts these into play, is he, they connect the city kind of in the way that railroads did. But instead of needing to go buy a ticket, instead of taking days and days and days to get there, you can just jump in your car and drive, right? The idea of the road trip, hey, let's get the family in the car and go to the Grand Canyon, yeah, right? Baby booming. That comes from interstate highways. Without interstate highways, you do not have that ability, right? And I picked some Texas ones to show you that, like I-35, like if you're driving to Austin, that's an interstate highway. You can take I-35 way up to Kansas if you can see. Um, I-10, 
same thing. Now it turns into other names, but I-10, if you go east, takes you through Louisiana and all the way through Louisiana. Um, these are critical, critical, critical. Suburbs are, be, or you can put a suburb further away, for example, because now you just get on the highway and get there, right? And these are really important interstate highways. They make travel easier. They're not quite time machines, but they're almost time machines, right? We're already kind of past the point where travel can be like a time machine, but they're close. Um, also, it's a federal spending opportunity, right? So you need to spend money to give people jobs to build these roads. So that's another thing that does. Uh, on top of transforming society, it gives people jobs and money. So quick minute and a half, and then we'll move on. We're almost done with notes, and then I want to kind of break down some of the primary sources from yesterday. About a minute on the clock. Thirty seconds. All right, we're making good time. I like this. Okay. All right, let's go to move forward. Let's talk about the last key point. Sunbelt region emerged as a significant political and economic force. I'll give you a quick 30 seconds. The Sunbelt region will emerge as a significant economic and political force. Now it's going to be important for representatives, for presidents to work in the Sunbelt, right? Get people that live there to vote for them and support them and things because the Sunbelt is going to be filled with people pretty soon, partly because of highways, partly because of baby boom, and partly because of job opportunities. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward. Again, the Sun Belt will emerge as a significant and political economic force. So this is the Sun Belt. I believe like this Northern end is the Snow Belt. Um, but massive migrations to the Sun Belt will happen from Northern states. Um, highways will make this easier as well as people kind of being sick of winter. Again, winter, mm. um, GIs and their families went there to seek opportunities in the growing defense market, especially because of the Cold War. You have all these opportunities to work in these private sectors, right? We talked about private sectors already. Um, tax dollars devoted to defense spending is being put in the South, meaning that the money for the South is in the Sun Belt. The money for defense, I'm sorry, not for the South, is in the South. So that's where a lot of people are moving to. It, may, it repopulates these states again, fills them with a lot of people. Um, so a quick minute and a half on that slide, and then we will move forward. And if there are any questions, let me know. This is the last note slide. We're going to move on from here and we're going to talk about some primary sources. The ones from yesterday. So if you did not do yesterday's assignment, I recommend you get it open so you can get some of that in there. If you already did it, you're good to go. Just open yours up and participate be an easy peasy second half of the class. Although it shouldn't take us that long, it should take us only about five, 10 minutes, I hope.
Uh, 15 seconds. A little less, about 10, sorry. All right, let's go to move forward. So that is it for this, but we are not done. Before you, no exit take yet, not that, not yet. Let me get this open. All right, so where is it, where is it, where is it? Here it is. So yesterday while I was out, hopefully, 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 all of you guys were working on this, right? And of course, primary source analysis, we've done this before, right? The main goal of it is to look down and, and practice hipping some sources. And this one was particularly image filled, but there was one text source from McCarthy at the end, right? So all I wanna do right now, guys, is I wanna open the floor up to you guys. So all you all have to do is I haven't, you should be able to access your copies on Google Classroom. If you cannot do it, let me know, but just open up your copy or just look at the image again. And I'm going to give you guys about how much time we got two minutes in the chat. And I want you to hit the document in the chat. You can literally just take what you put in Google Classroom and copy it into the chat, or you can just rehip it again. Um, so put like H and then put what your H is. I, what your I is, and P, what your P is, P, what your P is, right? Um, you can do it in one big chunk or you can send it to me in pieces, however you want to do it. But we have two minutes as a class or you guys have two minutes as a class, I should say, to hit this first one. So go ahead and go, two minutes on the clock. As soon as you have your answer, you can send it, just send it private. There we go, all right. Nice, okay. Those of you guys that are already sending them in, I appreciate that. I'll give you guys about two minutes, like I said, to have them ready. So far, I'm like, I'll, every H that I've seen is very spot on. So good job in that. Um, who sent me a couple? I got a couple. Yes. Spot on. About how much time we got left? A minute left, a little less than a minute. About 30 seconds, but I've seen a lot of responses. So if you're still sending me your response, please send it in. But I want to go ahead and get into this so that we can try to get through all of them. And then we can uh, I can give you guys time for the easy exit today. So the H, right? Historical context, what is it? McCarthyism, right? McCarthy said there's a bunch of communists in the State Department and people were freaking out. The Red Scare also is another good example. So like I said, I think everybody nailed that. And then for the audience, the intended audience, right? What do you got? the American people. Some people are saying maybe some communists too, maybe, but for sure the American people, right? You cannot deny that it's also the, it's the people, but you can also add and get specific, right? Maybe it's uh, people that didn't know what McCarthy said, but they see this and they're like, what? Right? Maybe it's like, it's like a simpler version of a McCarthy speech. That's another good one. Point of view is very anti-communist, right? Um, State Department has communists in it. Like it's, it's ally, it's, not ally and so it's like buying into McCarthy's story right whether or not you agree with McCarthy this cartoon or this artist probably does and purpose inform people about communism yep I agree I I would say right it's like a simplified version of telling people hey there's probably communists in the state department right so nailed it guys really good job so what about this one this one I like the um I don't even know, I guess kill it now is the title. Um, I'll give you another quick two minutes. Again, if you already filled these out, just copy and paste your responses in, or if you wanna hip them yourself real quick, you got two minutes. 
Go ahead and go. Two minutes on this one. What do we got here? Oof, I've already seen a couple of trigger words that I love. Nice. About a minute and a half left on the clock. About a minute and change. Kill it now. A little less than a minute, about 45 seconds. Again, make sure you get your responses in. Send them private. You good. No worries, spelling doesn't matter. All right. So last 20 seconds, I'm going to go ahead and start reading these off. If you're still typing, send it. All right, still send it. I'm going to use the chat log to help me out when I'm grading also. So, okay. Um, so one thing I'm seeing for context, right? Red scare. We're still in the middle of the red scare. There's communists in the U.S. Maybe there is or there isn't, right? But you would argue that it, it there is, but that either way, the red scare is going on. People are scared of communism in the U.S., right? Um, and like I said, most people, I think, pretty much nailed that. The red scare is going on. Now, who's the intended audience? I think the American people is really solid. And I think another strong one is if there are communists in within the American people, right, them as well. Um, What's the point of view? Very, very, very clearly anti-communist, right? Um, I saw people putting propaganda, right? What's the purpose? Well, this is a propaganda piece, right? It is designed to show Americans, right? Hey, if you're loyal to America, you can kill Bolsheviks, right? And Bolshevism is this horrible snake that's trying to kill you. So you got to kill it with loyalty, essentially, right? Really solid breakdown, guys. Um, how much time we got? Nine minutes. Let's do this one. This one, I, I actually really like this one. This one might be my favorite one of the three, even though I'd probably say that about all of them. Uh, um, it's okay, we're hunting communists. Commun the Committee on Un-American Activities. Again, I'll give you a quick two minutes. This is the last one we'll do. Um, we'll, do the, we'll do the text one. We'll have to do that one another time. What do you have for this one? What is the hit? About a minute and change. Seeing some good stuff so far. Um, yeah, if you just hit the, um, just if you can get all of it, you can get as many, get it in pieces if you want. You don't have to necessarily get everything in there, but I want to see kind of which pieces you can do. This is the image right here. Yep, that works. About 30 seconds, and then we will talk about what these are. Seeing some good stuff. Oh, that's a good term.
Okay. So um, from the responses that I've gotten, I like a lot of what I am seeing, right? So people are talking about the red scare, right? The red scare is, scare is still going on. People are still scared about communists. Yes, right? People in the U.S. are still scared. The red scare is happening. Now, there was a committee established, right, to find communists. That's something important. One thing to note, right, is that McCarthy said there's communists everywhere. And when he said that, he freaked everybody out, right? The red scare is act like it's people are scared. And what I like about this, right, intended audience, I would say is still probably American people, right? That's going to be it for a lot of these. Um, but when we get into the point of view and the purpose of these, it's not so much anti-communist, right, the point of view, as much as it is anti-committee almost. Um, and the reason I say that is because look at what these guys are doing. They're knocking down stop signs. They're knocking people over, potentially running them over. And their justification for hurting all these people or for breaking the rules is it's okay, we're hunting communists, right? And so what's the purpose, right? To show people that McCarthy's a little crazy. <laughs> He's take McCarthyism probably went a little too far, right? This is like the opposite of propaganda. This is perspective. Um, and it's a really good cartoon in that regard. Um, so if you guys uh, might have missed that, I urge you, like, take a look at it again just when you have time or, like, right now in the minute or so before we do the exit ticket. And let me know if you don't catch that. It's, it's, it's the flip on the propaganda, right? It's the idea of, hey, McCarthyism probably went a little too far because you'll see stuff like this, I guarantee it. You'll see what, like I said, perspective instead of uh, propaganda. And it's, it's, it's important, it's pretty cool. So um, thank you guys for participating. Those of you that helped out with the uh, primary source breakdown, like I said, that assignment's due. And those of you that did it, um, I've noticed in most of the ones that submitted it, like you did the hips really well. And then the questions, you know, maybe you're running out of time. Maybe it was just kind of like, oh, question after all these hips. The hip is the main grade. The questions are just tertiary. So like, if you haven't turned it in or if you did have it and didn't submit it, submit the hips at the very least that's where most of the points are going to come from and if you've already done that awesome um with that being said guys let's get into the exit tickets so if you go to google classroom and go to exit tickets you have like i said what's probably going to be the easiest exit ticket of all the ones that we're going to do for this unit it is a really easy low ball exit ticket and all you got to do let me pull it up here it is it should have just posted is Okay. Significance of interstate highways, significance of the baby boom. How does the GI Bill affect suburbanization in the United States? This shouldn't take you more than the three minutes we got left. It's pretty brief and pretty easy. All you got to do is give me a statement basically explaining why these are three important things. And with that being said, guys, I'm going to stop the recording.